Thank you all for attending today. Uh, it's been a wonderful year. We've been working on a lot of projects and gotten a lot of things accomplished with the help of everybody here and from myself and the council just want to say thank you. Um, I'm going to defer item one until the end. We'll go to item two, uh, which is EMS transition courses, looking at the requirements for those, for those courses. Um, if you haven't heard, um, transition courses um, are designed to transition currently nationally registered certified personnel uh, who were taught the old national standard curriculum uh, to the new EMS standards for each of the certification levels. Um, students that attended a program that teaches, um, that did not teach those standards will be required to take a uh, transition course. Now, one of the things I want to make really clear so rumors don't start flying, and that is this transition course is only required for persons who wish to maintain their national registry cert, okay? Only for people who wish to maintain their national registry cert. If you are, are not um, nationally registered, um, then it's not an issue for you. Uh, but for those who are in many jurisdictions and many, many uh, departments have asked that their personnel keep that because that was the certification that they spent <laughs> money for, uh, many of the jurisdictions and municipalities did. So um, one of the things that this committee is going to have to do is to um, look at the number of hours that will be involved in a transition course. We had a great meeting um, in, um, at Brazosport College. Um, thanks to John, John Creech, uh, took us over his lovely uh, campus, uh, and we were able to um, start to work on that project. The transition course is, is for us, we went through um, most of that document. Um, and as you all know that with an hour and a half meeting, it's hard for us to get a lot of work done. As you know today, disaster ran over, so we're starting 15, 20 minutes late, uh, which reduces our, our time again, uh, that we get most of our work done in the work groups um, that when we meet between meetings and we were able to, uh, during that six hour meeting, uh, was to go through a lot of the information in there um, to give us an idea of what was ahead um, and to um, start to look at that process. And that's what it's going to be. It is certainly going to be a process that is going to take us a little bit longer to get done, uh, but I also think it's one of those processes that when we start to look at development of programs uh, that everyone needs to be aware um, for the transition. Um, there are, when we met, um, excuse me, when we talked to Maxie, um, we are trying to figure out a way that we can offer these as CE um, to make it not onerous. We will certainly not want to make the hours onerous on anyone, but to if you have taught the new national standards as part of your curriculum, I think our recommendation um, in our meeting in Lake Jackson was that we would then um, ask dishes if you could just put that on your course completion certificate saying that this person had completed the correct number of hours for tran transition. Uh, if they were going to take this as part of uh, an initial program, if it was going to be part of CE, then they should be issued another CE certificate showing that the transition education had taken, had taken place. Um, again, we did not want this to be onerous. This is not something we, we wanted to um, have to take a long time to get done, but we just wanted to make sure that we could take this trend, transition as, as smooth as um, possible. Um, accreditation, keep in mind, is not required to teach in the transition courses. It's only going to be required as of January 1 of 2013. So again, we didn't want to make this onerous at all. Um, and that was the um, gist of that particular document for that, that meeting. Um, committee members that were at that meeting, is that pretty much the gist of that, Jeff? And, and uh, OK. Any, any comments from? 
I was negligent immediately, and forgive me today. I didn't go drinking last night, so maybe I should have. Um, I need to take take a roll. I'm here. Scott Bulleter. Here. Sandra Crady. John Creech. Here. Robert Gonzalez. Here. Scott Mitchell. Here. Robert Nappage. Here. Greg LeMay. Here. Lori Lefevers. Oscar Salazar. Here. We do have a quorum. Sorry. Actually, was there anything else we needed to do besides in our January meeting to start looking at the hours that you think will that we think to make a recommendation to you all and to GTAC for the number of hours for each transition? Yeah, Jody, that's uh, we will need that unless someone is out there. I don't want to hold people back. Uh, and if there's somebody that's ready to follow the guidelines that Nasimso has put out there and they want to teach their transition course accordingly, I really don't have a problem with that, but we really would like to have the rules and stuff in place. But also we want to be accommodating also. So if there is someone, for example, that want to go ahead and start teaching the new curriculum now and they can demonstrate that they're ready to teach and they send their course approval and all that stuff up, we can get it approved. Uh, of course, we won't mandate it until uh, sometime in 2012, probably September of 2012. But yeah, we, we would like the hours, because when you look at the gap analysis, there are things that we already require in Texas uh, that's on that gap analysis for different levels. For example, the uh, EpiPen auto injector. Well, we already teach that, so if we already teaching that and requiring that, then that's less time you got to spend on, a, on, on an actual transition class. And I want to make sure everybody understand also that that transition class, you have two different things working here. Remember, it's only required for persons who want to keep their national registry certification. It's not required for the Texas certification. Although I think uh, if providers should look at what's in there and have theirs, particularly when you start talking about ethics and those type of things, they, I would incorporate into continuing education. Um, so the one thing is that you have to have a national registry. Now when you have it for national registry, you have two options. You can have a standalone transition course and say we've done it, send a certificate up to the, with the individual and they can, uh, they're good. Or you can build it as part of that national registry refresher course. Now remember the National Register have different guidelines for that refresher course. So, but it doesn't require any additional hours. So you can throw that into the National Register refresher course and then subtract those hours. So I think it's from class A1 or some area of their thing that they have to have. So just know that you can do a standalone course or you can incorporate it into their entire recertification um, class. Any questions for Mr. Bishop? Any public comment? Okay. Item two, development of a checklist to assist EMS coordinators in the composition of transition courses to bridge the gap um, for the 2009 standards. Um, I think actually the way our agenda looks today, we can actually take three and four and five and actually put all of them together um, and finish them at one, at one time. Um, as most of you all have probably heard that part of the national standards uh, when we look at how mobile we are now, and I think if we go back and just look at the wildfires that we've had over um, just west of the Metroplex and certainly down here in Bastrop, that we had people coming from different areas, uh, people who were coming in to um, assist um, in, wild, in wildfires, and I think we can expect the same thing uh, when we have um, a medical disaster uh, where we might have more um, patients. So um, one of the things that we're looking at is trying to figure out who's who. And this is from an education standpoint, not a provider stand, standpoint, but to align names. Um, and when we were in Lake Jackson, we looked at the names and the recommendation was to, um, which is also part of the gap analysis, which is also part of the um, bridging work worksheet is to take 
um, the name changes so that they match. Uh, and that would change ECA to EMR, which is emergency medical responder. Uh, the basic would be dropped from EMT, and it would just be EMT. Um, and the inter intermediate, because I have people ask me all the time, is intermediate going away? And I can tell you the word will go away. <laughs> Uh, we would then look at advanced EMT, um, and then paramedic would remain the same. Um, and that would be for certifications to match, as we mentioned earlier, for the national, national standard. Um, again, we didn't want this to be onerous either, um, but it, I think it would help when we have people coming in or we're going out. Um, certainly, whatever your medical director credentialed you to do, that's what you would still do. Um, this is just a small nomenclature change um, to have us online so that when we're speaking uh, about national standards and about national curriculum, uh, we're all talking about the same thing. Committee members, comments? Jody, that name change is in statute, so that would have to come through statute. Uh, now, what will change when you look at that rule that we're proposing today is the word basic. Basic is not in statute, so I'm asking that we take it out. Uh, and we will have EMTs and not EMT basic, so we will remove that because that's, that basic is not in statute. But to change the uh, AEMT and the EMR and stuff, that has to be done in statute. We can't change that. But what we will say is in order to get an intermediate certification, you must take the AEMT exam. Uh, <clears throat> same thing with paramedic and what have you. Right. So today it would just be basically a, a recommendation from this group that when that statute gets, gets changed uh, so that it matches that it has come by the education committee and basically I think you're just looking for us to wave and say yes and, and that's uh, good. So any public, public comment? Morning Dudley. Hey, um, and I'll be happy to share this with you, but there's also a push by another group I know, I know they're trying to get this standardized across the United States, and I think, I think that's fantastic. Um, one of the things um, that has come out, um, there's been a push on recently through some of the national EMS um, leadership organizations to coordinate and work with international groups as well. And a lot of the international groups, in an effort to s help address the confusion that exists out there in the public about who's who and what's what, a lot of the international places, Australia, some places in Europe, places like that, um, are using the term paramedic for everything and getting away from EMT. Um, and so there is an, an international association of, of paramedicine that is recommending further name changes down the road. Not saying it's going to happen this year, next year, maybe not for five or six years or even longer that, that you'll see that start to bubble up, but instead of EMT basic or EMT, that would be paramedic, and then what we now know as a paramedic would be an advanced practice paramedic as it pushes down um, three, two year, three year, four year degree paramedic would be like an advanced practice paramedic. But using a single term so that the public knows when you say paramedic what that is, as opposed to, are you an EMT? No, I'm a paramedic, what's that? It's to help, it's further address the problem that getting the same names in all 50 states is gonna address for us. So just to let you know that's that's out there. It's starting to bubble a little bit, but it's I mean it's nowhere near where this is. You know, and 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 Dudley, that I think that's been a deal for years. When you ask the public what an EMT is, and they don't know, um, and I think sometimes even within our own community, <laughs> um, what that is is really based upon what your medical director says you can do. Um, so um, good, good. We will. Uh, um, continue down the road and, and you know at, at some point um, when we look at trying to advance this occupation slash profession um, there will probably be some more name changes and duty duties uh, that will be unchanging uh, so to give us a better opportunity to take care of the public so uh, committee anything else I mean uh, any more public comment Moving along, uh, review of 2009 National EMS Education Gap Analysis. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk about that since you kind of led that one when we were? Say again, Jody, I'm sorry, I was occupied looking <laughs> something up. 
Um, the oh, the gap now. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And I didn't go out drinking last night either. <laughs> What we did is we looked at the gap analysis sheet and went through and took the recommendations that we got from the other two committees and um, evaluated what the suggestions were and reviewed each one of them in detail from a global perspective of how it impacted EMS in general and not specifically to a certain organization or a certain requirement and for the education program. So our recommendation that we looked at after looking at this is, is approaching it from the standpoint of retaining what we had as far as Texas is concerned in the EMS education programs and anything that went beyond that with some of the recommendations was to go through credentialing through a medical director. And so that, that kind of sums up basically what we did is we looked at it said, yep, sounds important. The, uh, from the educational program standpoint of teaching certain specific skills, these are the things that we think is important. We did not get any input back from the medical directors committee. I'm not sure why. And then uh, we blessed it to move forward. Some of the other requests to put things in, and honestly, I can't recall off the top of my head specifics other than maybe crikes and things like that should be taught at the provider specific level in the organization and credentialed by a medical director. Okay. Um, we had um, <clears throat> we did have input from the EMS committee, and we took a look at all of those, and we did make three. There were actually three, three changes. One was, after a lot of talking in, in looking at the standards and what people use and what they don't use, and, and I think what is sometimes difficult for the group is we all get into our own zone and that is where I work we do this and we're in and we have to remember this is for an entire state but um, our recommendation there were actually three changes uh, one is that mast and pneumatic anti-shock garment be removed period um, <laughs> it, it, it's it, it, if you want to use them for pelvic fractures great and there were some people that said, yeah, we want to use them for, for pelvic fractures. Again, if your medical director wants you to carry pneumatic anti-shock garment, great. Uh, but as far as that being one of those skills that we continue to teach, which very few people are using, we just felt like that one would not be continued. Um, urinary catheterization was added to A, E, M, T, and medic uh, with many of the drugs that we're giving to increase cardiac output, to decrease preload, to help with congestive heart failure. Uh, if we're going to give those drugs, we felt like it would be um, the right thing to do to allow patients to have a uh, opportunity to void without, um, how can we put this, spilling in the back of the box, or as we heard some people tell us, just hold it, sir, we'll be at the hospital in just a few minutes. Um, and we felt like putting that skill in there, especially looking to, as Dudley mentioned a minute ago, as we go to some advanced practice things and we start to look ahead, uh, it doesn't take that much longer to teach someone how to insert a urinary catheter. We also added venous sampling, uh, was added to A, E, M, T, and paramedic um, in the state SO, SOP columns. Um, we looked at that, again, looking at who's transporting, looking at transport times, um, and allowing them to do that venous sampling uh, we felt was fairly important. Um, the other recommendations from EMS committee and education committee uh, at skills that would be taught, we felt like it would probably be best to refer that to the local medical director uh, to allow them, if it's something they want their EMTs to do, Again, we go back in Texas and we know that our ECAs or EMRs, if the name changes, are transporting patients. Um, what skills should they be able to provide for those long transports? Uh, and instead of putting that into rule and into skill, uh, the committee felt that it would probably be best um, if we left that to be taught um, in a local credentialing process with their medical director. I think those were the three. Did I leave anything else out? Comment by Dr. Gonzalez. I think you were actually talking about this too when we were, were there. Any uh, comments? No. no. Okay. Committee? Any, any public comment? <clears throat> um, 
Thank you for that. Um, I, I, that's great to hear. Um, our committee spent a lot of time trying to look at that globally and not as individual agencies. And um, I was trying to pull it up on my computer and my battery's dead. So um, pharmacologically assisted intubation, was that one of the ones we're going to leave to agencies and medical directors? Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and I certainly understand that. I, I applaud the others. I think that's fantastic, um, including the, the urinary catheterization. That was a big deal. It, it, that came up because it was, I think it was there, but it was not checked for anything. And all of the op almost all the operators on, on the EMS committee were like, no, that's, even if, you, even if we don't use it, mm -hmm. that's a very beneficial skill to at least have in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, but on the pharmacologically assisted intubation, my concern about that is after newspaper articles three or four years ago and other issues like that, although I agree that that should be left to the medical director and the EMS agency, um, there are EMS agencies out there that are taking brand new paramedics fresh out of school and putting them in an environment where they have the ability to use those medications with no training at all. And so that was one of the reasons we wanted at least something in that skill set to talk about that. I understand if it's too much and, and all that, but that was our reasoning behind that was that there are folks all over this state that are being put on boxes fresh out of school with PAI medications. Um, and saying, oh yeah, here, here, here's our protocol, read up on it, and that's all they get. Mm -hmm. And that's, in, in, that's embarrassing for us when that comes out in the paper like it did three or four years ago. So that was the reason we had, we had, we had asked for that as well. But I think um, otherwise, I think everything's cool. I think you're referring to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram article yes, that uh, came out a few years ago. You Absolutely. know, it, when, when we looked at it, the PAI is scary. I mean, it's actually scary when physicians do it. It's scary when, when anesthesiologists and anesthesia personnel do it. Um, and maybe that's something we can look at as if we can hold the physician's feet to the fire for doing, <laughs> doing that. Because we actually talked about this. This, this. We went back and forth because, yeah, we actually felt like, you know, maybe we should put that in there. Maybe that is a skill that we should teach. Uh, and there was a little consternation from uh, fear, just yes. fear of someone using sucks well, or VEC or whatever and putting someone under and can't get an airway and can't bag them and you're 25 minutes away and oh now, Lord, I know. now the pooch is, you know, helpless. Uh, yeah, that's, but that's, yeah, that's every day for a lot of people. And, yeah. and I certainly understand that. But I wanted you all to understand why we, why we put yeah. that in there was that the, we see it in, our, in, in the operational world a lot of medics who are getting themselves in trouble because they're being ex they're, they're being given that that tool without instruction on how to use it and and it's probably not appropriate to put that in the initial education environment and try to make up for it there our thought was though it if we did put it there at least we know they'd at least hear it right once so that was that was why we did that but um otherwise thanks for those um, additions those are great Jane good morning thank you Dudley I'm sure that mine that I'm bringing here is just an oversight, but I pulled off Appendix B, the skill comparison that was on the documents for this meeting that y'all have been working on mm -hmm. developing. Mm -hmm. And I know that most of the programs will be utilizing this as a way to make sure their holes are plugged in, in their initial training as well as developing the transition courses. And while I agree with you about the MAST and PASG, I'll just point out on page two of that poor paid document that you still have it marked as the state SOP for EMT, AEMT, and paramedic for MASS and PASG. So noted. Okay. <coughs> thank you very much, Jane. The intent was to take that out for all four levels. So thank you. Any other public comment? Committee, I would entertain a motion to refer this document with those changes to Department of State Health Services. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. All opposed, sign of no. Motion carries. We will refer this to Department of State Health Services. Um, on October 14th, we met at Brazosport College, um, as I mentioned earlier, down in Lake Jackson um, with John Creech and basically did 
the transition course discussion. And during that transition course discussion, we actually took the entire document. And there were some questions that we had. And we emailed some of those questions out. I remember there's um, Joe Hamilton's here. Um, Joe had some folks there. And uh, we actually have emailed those to uh, DOT. There were some questions about technician training for EMRs in HAZMAT. And we were trying to figure out, because the way it was worded, it would mean that they would have to be a technician. And we thought, well, why would an EMR, a first responder, have to be a technician? Um, so we have emailed DOT asking for clarification, because in the document it said certification. We're hoping they just meant training. <laughs> Uh, because if they have to be certified in that, some of that training is almost as long as an EMR course. Um, so that one we will uh, continue to work on, but we haven't received a word back from DO DOT yet. Um, John, you want to talk about anything else that happened while we were? No? No, uh, no, Jody, I think you covered just about everything we did there um, as far as the agenda-wise and stuff. But those of us that were Brad's support college just want to say what an honor it was to have such an illustrious group come out. Enjoy that, and at the same time, you know, it's interesting about the Education Committee. Things get, things get done, you know, and when we do show up, things get done. And so it's nice to be able to sit here at this meeting going, this is what we think happened. So that's all I have. What he's, what he's not telling you is they have a beautiful brand new building <laughs> with beautiful brand new labs. <laughs> uh, and, and I was jealous. I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest, I was pretty jealous. But We all remember what it's like to you know, have that Passat that I've been driving that was, um, Mr. Walker can appreciate that. Is that 76? You know, we're all th thinking 86 wasn't bad, but it's nice to be moving up to maybe a Escalade, you know. We did have a couple of programs there, and, and basically um, we did what we always do. Jeff McDonald was there. Um, Jeff came in, did a fantastic job, along with uh, John, to answer, answer questions and, and help work with uh, folks. Um, and actually, as of that date, that was this committee's 21st accreditation workshop since 2007. Uh, that was number 21. Um, we have traveled all over the state, and we will continue to help anybody when they need it, all the way up to the zero hour. Um, so if there's something that you need, please contact a member of this committee, contact me, uh, and we'll be more than happy to set something up for you to assist. There is item seven, review and approval of changes to DSHS, um, Title 25, Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 157.32, entitled the Emergency Medical Services Education Program Course Approval. Um, if you look at the document, it is 867 lines. We read them. I think everybody on the committee probably read them. Um, and basically, our committee started part of this a while ago with the changes to the education training manual. Um, when Jane gave us the dates, the rules would be coming up and what needed to be done, we saw that our first one was gonna be the education training manual, so we kind of took that one and said, okay, let's just start. Um, that one is finished. That one will go to Phil Lockwood for review, for Dish's review there, please, um, we look forward to that coming back to us with whatever changes. Uh, but just a quick synopsis, uh, we took almost all of the forms in there because all the educators in this room, um, you know that when you need a notification form, you need anything, you go back to that manual. Well, sometimes you have version number three and we're up to version number six. Um, so what we wanted to do was take all the forms out and link them so that as Department of State Health Services made changes, we could just go to the link in the DISH's website and be assured of getting the appropriate document. 
Um, we also know, too, that the gap analysis will, gap analysis will also have to be part of um, the training manual, which we've been waiting just to get a final so we could submit that to him. Um, we tried to update the manual as, as best that we could, and that is a very difficult manual to do. Um, this committee spent a lot of time trying to make that manual work for basic and advanced, trying to make that, that manual work for people who are in small programs or private programs as well as large ones, and it was just um, some of the requirements, some of the um, um, difficulties in doing that, but I think we got most of them ironed out. We will supply a copy to that, of that to dishes as well as posting it on the website for public comment uh, to take a look um, at that document. Having said that, we'll also probably need to include the document 157.32, which is the EMS education program and course approval uh, section. Uh, which deals with if the names are changed, when the names are accepted, uh, making some of those changes. Uh, the document predominantly deals with accreditation of paramedic programs and how we will adopt those. Um, most of the changes in here simply deal with the documentation needed to have your program, and most of that documentation will come from um, either KHEP or COAMPS, um, it also deals with violations. Um, it deals with the training programs and dates. Um, the substantive change to this um, pretty much was on lines 410 through 466, which basically said this is what you'll need to submit for your program, for an advanced program. And it's simply everything that we've done in the past um, but with the other documents from COAMPS and KHEP, um, which was, was pretty much the ingest of this document. Max, someone did ask me one question, and I said, you know, that's a really, a really good one. Let me, let me ask Dishes. That if your program is nationally accredited at the paramedic level, would you then also need a state accreditation visit? We haven't decided yet how we're going to handle it. Now, you know we do have, uh, I guess you could say, a carrot. For those programs that are currently accredited, there are some things we don't do in compliance, but we figure if they are accredited, I think we're going to broaden that a little bit, but we haven't had a chance to just say exactly what it is we're not going to do. But those programs that are currently accredited, um, it, it's abbreviated, and it might get abbreviated some more, to be honest. Okay. So it'll basically make it easier and just the flow will be Well, it'll make good. it easier, but if somebody else has already done it, then um, we don't have to. Okay. Committee, comments? John? Just, just a question because that's come up. Um, so we're not, for the new uh, programs, if we're accredited, you're going to allow the accreditation to be part of the self-study, so we won't have to pay that $235. Dollars. I didn't say you weren't going to have to uh, pay that much. Just check it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to register that program. <laughs> okay. Just, I just, clarification, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any other committee, committee comment on saving $235? <laughs> Jane? knew you weren't going to get through this one without me at the microphone, right? I'm, and I'm semi-glad we're not. <laughs> I have actually, I think, three things, uh, mostly clarification. On, in the 157.32 from lines 102 down to like 136, which involves the wording changes for the emergency medical technician intermediate curriculum. I guess I'm confused because having restructured my course so that it meets the uh, EMTA curriculum, what we had before that we decided in these blocks as the subset of the National Standard Curriculum were to include items and such that uh, we wanted as a state back when we set this. And then in changes to the AEMT curriculum, I found that those items were pretty much covered in the new AEMT curriculum with the exception of some additions that I did not have because it wasn't required before, such as hazmat at that level, radiation emergencies, 
and it's basically a subset of the medical emergencies from paramedic. Uh, so basically what I ended up doing was going to my paramedic curriculum for medical emergencies and, and taking out stuff that was not applicable to AEMT, but it still covered all the same topics. That's not mentioned anywhere in our list here, so I'm curious on the wording, do we mean up top where it says required by portions of the current national paramedic, and should it say and advanced emergency medical technician so that it covers all of that material, or should all of this be reworded to incorporate Portions all of it? Portions is deleted. When it's bold and in bracket, that's being deleted, so it says. Okay. So then if that's by the, the case, current. Then do we need this section? Because well, and that's the thing, Jane. When we went through to make it, we wanted to make minimal change to the rule. You're right. It's a duplication in some cases. Mm -hmm. It really is. But I didn't want to mess with as I want to minimize the changes that we. So it is a duplication, but I want to minimize the change to the rule and simply address the requirement for the curriculum that you have to teach in order to get that certification at a specific level delete basic from EMT because statute doesn't say anything about basic, that was the only rule, and then require the national, I'm sorry, require accreditation. Those were the goals, but as far as that other, we will have to go back and clean all that stuff up when we, because this rule will still be open when, as like the whole packet will. So right. this rule is just to address those three things basically, okay. and then we'll take all that duplication okay. out. I was just worried because But I want to make sure that people here. knew that you still have to do it too, but that's the big thing. It's I was just worried that if it was left like this, as going through this time, that there would be confusion in program design out for, for folks trying to see, well, oh, all I have to meet is this, but yeah. You know. Okay, no. you get the point. Yeah. Okay, next thing I have is, and it has to do with the wordings, and really it's questions about the wordings for the national accreditation standards and stuff that you're changing so that we're coming up to that. One is, uh, it mentions, and I don't remember the lines, I didn't bring them up here, but about that the state will want a copy of the self-study, the co-amp self-study and all of the, you know, interactions that involve whether or not you're going to lose your co-amps, basically. Uh, does that mean that that's going to be retroactive? Because right now, we have our self-study for the state and then we have our self-study for co-amps. Are we saying that programs that now have a, a co-amp self-study in that we need to forward those on to the state as soon as this rule is done or do we need to wait till we're accredited and then get you a copy of that? When you're accredited. Okay. So it will be retroactive, but once we're accredited, then we give you a copy. Once you're accredited, we really are more interested in that letter from COA saying that you're accredited. We can look on that website and see you right. accredited. That's what we're really interested in. Yeah, but in your deal, it says that you want a copy of the COA self-study. I think it says may. I may. I think it says may, not must. May, okay. Okay. Because uh, I just thought, man, we're going to be burdening you. I know ours is huge. You got it on disk or something. That's easy. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We're getting away from paper. Yeah. Thank God. Huh? Rule says shall. Shall. Oh. Okay. Okay. So that that was one well, of our things. Depending on what part of rule you're looking at, too, are you talking about uh, what where line are you on? It's line 417. Because we know if you get the letter, what you know, of course, if you want the self study, that's fine. It's just another step that we got to do. But we didn't know if you realized that it said that you would get that. I can see it if we're applying. You know, to give it to you, so you know we've applied. But if we're accredited, do we need to go back and give you that? Um, again, that's bold and then bracketed. Oh, okay. 417. Okay. So the bold and the bracket stuff is the new stuff? Mm -hmm. Is it coming out? Okay. It's coming out. Yeah. Gotcha. That was confusion on our part. The last thing I have is more of a, a clarification thing if you've gotten any further with some of the conversations we've had in the past. And it's, it's not really directly related to the wording, but it is because I don't know if it needs to be in there. Sponsors for programs that are like ours, you know, because we're a standalone program, so we have to have a sponsor until we figure out how to fight that battle. Um, is there going to be a method for, let's say tomorrow our sponsor decide, you know what, we don't want to do this anymore. Now we have to find another sponsor, but we have students in the middle of a program. Is there going to be a method to allow, or we, you know, if a sponsor pulls out tomorrow, all of a sudden your program's gone completely away. All those students have to be thrown out of the program and they're going to catch the raw end no, of the No, that's field. not true. Those students, that class, if you started that class, that class can't continue. Okay. So there is a method for that. That's just what I wanted to clarify. That just there was like a if you start protect. a class before the end of this year right. Right. and they go into next year and you're not accredited, right. that class can't continue. Good. I just want to make sure the students were protected because you'd be in a that's situation where you have priority. students that are in the middle of a program. Okay. 
right, that's all I have. Thanks. Now, if your medical director quit, that might be a yeah. different problem. Thank you, Jane. Joe? Good morning. Good morning. Um, if the committee will indulge me three questions, I'd, you know, uh, it's kind of out of a Monty Python movie, but let's go. Um, first question was a clarification on the, um, the, the naming of the certifications. Um, could you please explain? We were a little echoey in the back, so we couldn't hear that exactly. That will not change. Statutory. That's statute. We have ECAs in Texas, although they take the first respond exam for the National Registry. Yes, we will do the same thing for AEMT. They will be an intermediate in the state of Texas, but rather than taking the I-85 or the I-99, they will be required to take the AEMT exam. Yes. And Very paramedic good. will take paramedic. Very good. Um, thank you, sir. My, my second question, and actually is more of a statement, are cons I'm to get down here. My <laughs> you can take that Joe, off. Can you Joe. move that one up, Jane? What did you anyway, uh, no. With the um, my is more of a statement. Our concerns at Brazosport College uh, earlier this fall related to the National Registry of EMTs examination of the uh, EMR and EMT basic level. Those will become effective January first, twenty twelve. And our, as we discussed that day, that does include um, hazardous, uh, has whopper awareness level in EMS operations. And our, we, I, I want to applaud you and the committee for seeking out the, the NHTSA and trying to find an answer for us. I am disturbed that they have not responded back. And I'm concerned because my students are going to test at that level in January. And I need to know if they're going to need to have HAZWOPER awareness level um, in order to pass the operations portion of the examination. If they can pass it today, they can pass it first. It won't be It is a, a much more complicated no, it's not. curriculum than, it, than we are currently presenting in the EMT basic curriculum. Right, but look how the National Registry tests. They will not be testing your hazmat skills and stuff. But that is my understanding, that's just an awareness. But I, nobody brought that to my attention. I wish you had called me. I could have made the call myself. No. Uh, but no, it's, as far as I know, it's merely an awareness at that level. But I will I, double check and I will send you an email when I get back from Alabama. I'll, I'll, let me get with you after the meeting. I'll, let me explain what communications I have made. Uh, and my third questions relate to the, uh, the rule as we were reading today. And I wanted to go through, uh, if you have this in front of you on page four, uh, number 157, line 57, 157. And we refer to uh, current certification as an uh, EMTI or current certification as a national registry, EMT, EMTI, or AEMT shall be required prior to beginning field and clinical rotations for paramedic level. And I'm, I'm, that is a new <coughs> nuance. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the Department of Redundancy Department. But um, that's a nuance in, in our rules process. That means that unlike our current rule, we will have to have national registry testing and certification at the intermediate level, I'm sorry, the advanced EMT level in order for students to participate in clinical level at paramedic. And that seems to be a contradiction of terms. I think that was or. It says or. Instead of and, I think it was or, EMT basic or current certification. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Joe. This, no, this is what we need because, Sorry, you know, guys, I just wanted to make sure I had We read break. this stuff so many times that, you know, after a while, it's good to have other eyes on it because you just kind of go, okay, I think Oops. we got it, but yeah. Oops. Oops. <laughs> um, the last question, I'm sorry to com take your time up with this uh, no. because my, my ignorance is showing now. On page uh, 9, number 396, we're talking about the National Accrediting Organization uh, recognized by the department. And I think you answered this question already, uh, 
Mr. Bishop, but uh, did we, are we saying that the accre nationally accredited programs will now not have to go through a Texas self-study and fee payment process? Uh, they'll still go through it, but it will be abbreviated. Okay. And we won't deny you the opportunity to give us money. We just, <laughs> just want to show our support, you know. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Any other public comment? Just real quick to make a, a clarification that we'll find out as we get the information on the, the hazmat aspects. Make sure everybody you stay aware that if it's, if it's a hazmat awareness class, that's a maximum of about eight hours. It's delivered in the fire academies, both for the, the TCFP and state firemen's fire marshals. So that's significantly different than an 80-hour technician class. Yeah. So just want to make sure everybody's on the same page on nomenclature and then we'll get clarification on that. Well, that's the good thing about the state. We can always tell them what we want to do. We <laughs> yeah, we wanted to make sure that it was the awareness and not the technician course uh, to get that one, that one done. Um, review and approve changes. I guess we need a motion. So moved. Moved and second, committee has reviewed and approved the changes that we will forward these changes to DSHS. Any discussion? All those in favor, sign of aye. Aye. All those opposed, sign of no. Motion carries, we will send that document to DSHS as well. We need to look at a date for our January workshop meeting. Hey, Jody, why are y'all looking at that date? I want to uh, introduce our manager. We have a new manager in our Houston office, Marilyn Talley. Uh, it's Marilyn? Marilyn here? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we were really excited we were able to get that position filled. So, uh, we, uh, Marilyn is down there now. She's worked there for a while, and I think she'll do a great job. So, just wanted to make sure y'all recognize she was there. Welcome. Is this your first GTAC meeting ever? I didn't think so. <laughs> Good deal. Welcome. Um, committee, 6th, 13th, 20th, or 27th of January? Knowing that, knowing that we might have to adjust, um, we do our best to make sure that Department of State Health Services has the agenda and the location 45 days before a meeting, which is required. Um, every now and then someone will ask me if we can put something on the agenda and I'm forced to tell them no because it takes 30 to 45 days to get it through the legal process. It has to be posted in Texas Register. So um, forgive me because I know there's one person in this room that asked me to put something on this agenda um, and unless it's 45 days prior to, so that's why you're going to see us here in a moment look at some things we need to put on the agenda for next time. Um, if, you, if you have something or, or you feel that something is just burning and we have to get it done, send me an email early um, and I'll see what we can do. But uh, it wasn't an oversight. It wasn't that no, we can't. It's just that we have to have that done 30 to 45 days. Where do you want to meet you? I'm open. And I, I volunteer our, is it on? Hello, hello, hello. Now, now it is, isn't it? No? I volunteer our Mark Saxon, host of me. So we have Saxon and McAllen. Thank God they're close to each other. <laughs> okay. Um, Jody and the map is only about this far. <laughs> yeah. So we have Saxe and McAllen. Have we looked at a date yet? Six or 13. Six or thir 13? 13th is NAMSP conference. Okay, we don't want to do that then. Six, which is right after the ho holidays. It's too close. 20th? 20 or 27. 
Committee, what's your pleasure? 27. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Either one. Either one. Yeah. Pick a date. Okay. Committee, you all trust me to finish this 20th or 27th. I'll check with Ms. Allen and Saxe and see what we can work out, and I'll get it out as fast as we can because if you need to make travel plans, I uh, want to make sure that we can get that done early. That work? Jane. Since you're working on that date and the agenda, what I would like to request to be put on the next agenda is to go back and revisit, if we can, some way for either this committee, the state representative, someone to assist programs in working with the hospitals uh, for especially operating room and intubation stuff. We're having problems in various sections of the state again. In fact, our sponsor called me yesterday uh, and said their entire hospital, that's their primary site threw everybody out, including respiratory therapy, RNs, everybody. They have no OR side, effective immediately. They're scrambling. Uh, we have an affiliate in our program that has lost three ORs in the last three months because they've just decided they don't want students there anymore. And so, it, you know, I'd like to see if there's some way we can get some assistance in working with hospitals again to open up what it is it's going to take for us to get back in because it's not just us. It's, it's uh, various programs that I'm hearing out there saying we're losing our ORs, we're finding ER, we're finding OB, whatever, but we're losing our ORs left and right. We need some help. Okay. <laughs> Scott? I have a possible solution to the OR problem because we have worked it out this way and it happened to work. The anesthesiologist had a problem with our students being in the OR because their malpractice insurance covered them, but if the student made a mistake, they didn't want that student's mistake to be on their malpractice. So what we did is we hired them as adjunct faculty added them to our malpractice insurance just like our students and that sufficed and made the anesthesiologist happy so that's the way we got into the operating room so if that helps any other program that's the way it worked for us so if the anesthesiologists or CRNAs have a problem with that usually if you cover them under your malpractice they might let you into their uh, surgical suites thank you you know and that's I think what we just saw is what Jane had and I think it's going to be a think tank you know, where we have that, we have added to the trauma, you know. I think adding it to the trauma rule would be great, but man, you talk about a, wow. I like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and Jane, this is a multi-prong issue. I mean, it, some of it's politics, some of it's students, some of it's bad training, some of it's no malpractice insurance, some of it, I like Jerry, but I don't like you, and, and it just, which is not true. I like you, I don't like Jerry. Um, which is, you know, that multi-prong, so if there's something that this committee can do to help people, you know, it, uh, it was part of the accreditation, if you all noticed, when we went to certain places, sometimes they were having a problem talking to someone because of past history. And we would go, kind of go in as an independent third party and go, hi, can we get you two to agree on this? Because it's really not that you don't want them, you don't like Bob. So if we can get past Bob and, you know, work it out. So good deal. Good deal. Jody? Yes. There's one thing that I would like to put on the agenda to talk about. <coughs> I'm fixing to lose all popularity votes in the state. But the idea of having two different paramedics in your ambulance, one who has been through the transition training and one who hasn't because he's a state-only paramedic, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think if you're a paramedic in Texas, you should have the same skill sets and the same knowledge. Now, if trying to make it a rule Yes, be a headache for, for dishes. But if we add it into our CE requirements, could that not be done? <coughs> so that all of us are the same. Did he, did, did y'all not hear me in the back? It's, it's the webcast. Oh, the webcast. Sorry, Webbers. Find one that works.
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Cover and concealment. Uh, what I what I was saying for for you Webers, I'm sorry, is uh, two different paramedics in the state of Texas. National Registry paramedics have to go through a transition program to make sure all their skills are what is in the gap analysis and some education. If you're a Texas certified paramedic only or if you choose to drop your national registry so you don't have to do that, I, I see that as an issue. Uh, a lot of programs should take it upon themselves through CE and their medical directors to make sure everybody's equal, but I don't see that happening. I would like to look at it either through a CE rule or your certification rule that you have the training that is going to be equal across the board as a paramedic in Texas. You want to look at this at just one level or all? All. That's it. Throw darts now. Thank you. We'll also have number two. Number two will be there for at least two more meetings, and that is discuss the requirements for approval process um, for transition courses. Um, but we've been able to move a couple of things off the agenda today, so that's good. A um, couple of quick announcements. If you haven't heard, meetings for February, excuse me, meetings for 2012 have been posted, GTAC meetings. February 8th through the 10th, May 9th through the 11th, August 15th through the 17th, and November 17th through the 19th. Jane, um, conference is here in Austin next year, right? I want to remind everyone, too, that um, during the Texas EMS Conference Monday, the 21st at 1 p.m., we'll be hosting a coordinator update uh, at the Hilton Hotel in room 406. Um, there will be some other opportunities to attend the 2012. Uh, Max assures us they're looking at about eight locations across the state to do that. But uh, if we have any coordinators here, if you can, can go tomorrow, that would be great. Um, also, too, hats off to uh, Jeff and Scott Bolliter um, on the annual Texas Research Forum. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot of work and when we were actually discussing it earlier, um, Scotty, why don't you tell them what you said? Actually, I'd like to begin by noticing our rec, or, or just pointing out Dr. Villers who's in the room and Dr. Wampler who's actually currently in the classroom. If it wasn't for the help of the University of Texas Health Science Center, um, I don't think our state could spell the word research and EMS in the same sentence. And, and it's true. And we all got to admit it. We weren't doing it. And we weren't participating like we should have. And from an EMS perspective, clearly we do a great deal in, in medicine, emergency medicine and surgery and all the rest. But in emergency medical service, we really have done something special. Speaking with Dr. Uh, Baxter Larman, a good friend in Salt Lake two weeks ago, um, he was not only quite surprised, um, he was also quite elated that we're one of the few conferences that not only have a forum, but that, that also teach those who are interested in getting involved in emergency medicine research how to make that happen. And so if you've not been to the research forum, it's tomorrow night, it'll be at, uh, sorry, Monday, 4 o'clock to 5.30. Refreshments are served. Um, Dr. Villers, Dr. Manifold, is it also? I believe there'll be several other people walking around. The poster presentations will be done. It's just a fantastic opportunity to ask real questions and make things happen. And it really is. Um, the University of Texas Health Science Center took a lead role in it. And there have been a whole bunch of folks. The Education Committee took a lead role in it. And it really made things happen. So if you've not seen real science, it's time for us to just step up and make it happen, because it was great. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Any other announcements from the committee? 
Any other announcements from the public? Jody. Jody. Yes. Jody. yes. <clears throat> Maxi, do you mind speaking to the recertification application compu computer malfunction real quick, just so kind of everybody gets another overview of that, that the online recertification issues that we're having, or has that been resolved? Oh, that's good. It's been resolved then, right? Uh, nobody called me and told me they were having a problem. I didn't they're, wasn't aware of it. They're actually um, on, the, on the DSHS website. It's yeah. recertification application process. They cha we changed it. We switched to a different system, actually, in Fernando. That's where we went to be able to pay online. And it's, I don't know all the details because I'm not a tech person, but I do know now you can go on and pay online. Is a recertification, not initial, but the research thing. For yeah. research. Yeah, it's only for research. Right. Okay. So that glitch should be gone. I know they, they took it down for a minute so they can install the new program. So now you should be able to go online and do it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was a selfish question, actually, because I'm up and I wanted to make sure I got all my stuff done in time. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime y'all have a problem, feel free to call me. That's kind of why I'm there. And I actually answer my own phone. I don't have someone answer my phone. And my numbers are listed, so, or emails. So just feel free to call me if that kind of stuff happened. Because sometimes I'm not aware of every little thing that goes on in the office, especially during conference time. I want to tell everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room that we have a wonderful, group of people that sit on this council, excuse me, on this committee, sorry, on this committee. But I think we have just a wonderful group of people involved in EMS education at all levels. Um, we looked back at a lot of things that had happened over the past year, um, looked at um, a couple of vacancies that we had. Um, Jeff Hayes and John Creech. Um, have given a lot of time and a lot of effort, and they were reappointed uh, to the committee. Um, and unfortunately, last year, um, someone who had been very valuable to this team just forgot to put their application in. So they've been off the committee a um, year, and we reappointed Dr. Lance Villers, uh, who'd been extremely helpful in getting a lot of research done. Um, let's give them a hand. I think they all. <laughs> when you look, we are here to work on education issues. Those are the things that we work on and we get those. There's one position yet to be filled. Um, certificates are not ready today and I will tell you that we'll do that at the February meeting because I think there are those things that need to happen. Uh, and I apologize for that one. Um, in looking what we had, we had a large group of people and are trying to pick, uh, and it was very, very difficult to do. Uh, I think EMS and education had the two largest groups of people uh, who wanted to serve on this illustrious committee and, and work with a lot of people to get things done, and I think that has been just one of the true joys uh, of of being here, so um, that's where we are. Well, we will next meeting. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you.